on the European side of things, the three top line issues here are one, the effect of this on um, the war in Ukraine and whether or not this actually does split American and European attention, demand other military assets to be distributed or not. Two, if it actually has a major impact on trade in the Eastern Mediterranean, which would be immensely problematic for Europe as a whole, including those me- those former and non-members of the EU, just because of the way that they because of European reliance on trade from Asia. And three, the potential for accelerating spillover effects that trigger more refugee crises. And that would shock the European domestic political model enough to really trigger social problems. The first issue, that of Ukraine, it depends on how widely the conflict spirals. Um, and obviously, there's there's definitely an incentive for Iran to expand this conflict further. But there's also, on the other side, a desire to very much... It's not clear that, the, that jihadist organizations don't like Europe, but it's not clear how much your average citizen of one of the Gulf Arab states that, or Iraq or Syria really dislikes France or Germany or the UK or the EU. It's just, it's just not apparent. Um, So there's, there are some incentives to keep it somewhat contained, but once, once missiles start flying, it only takes a miscalculation or two or Americans say intelligence involvement and help with Israeli targeting to push this over the line. I mean, as we saw with, um, as we now know, given the information that came out of the Pentagon a couple weeks ago in Ukraine, there have been situations where it's been, you've had very close calls between Western aircraft and Russian aircraft. Similar, a similar phenomenon is easily possible if this actually goes off. If it splits attention, then cohesion starts to get sapped for Ukraine then the Ukrainians themselves probably start to suspect that the West is less likely to remain engaged in the fight. And the more problematic and the more space that Russia has to start to insert itself informationally, that China does as well, the more likely the conflict in Ukraine gets wrapped up in a way that's advantageous to Russia and disadvantageous to Europe and Kiev. So that's top line implication number one. Why is it top line? Because in the end, the most fundamental issue for European security period right now yeah, sure. will all, will be Ukraine until the war has been ended. Two, if you start to see shipping costs skyrocket in the Eastern Mediterranean because you have insurance problems, much like you did in the Black Sea, that's going to be cost a lot of people a lot of money. That's going to very thoroughly disrupt global supply chains because you'll have to reroute stuff all the way around South Africa into Europe. And that's also going to, again, push a lot of these goods from Ukraine, especially food exports, straight into the EU rather than mediating them um, through maritime transport. Have you seen that's... recently like prices moving? Because that would be obviously another kind of interesting indicator <laughs> if people are already um, I buying mean, when insurance. It comes... Yeah, not not so much. I mean, when it comes to you, the reality is the thing I do find is markets do not li- like to price in war risk. They oh. really don't like to. Um, and I perhaps the I mean, shipping insurance costs might be something that's worth keeping an eye on out of anything, just because Lloyd's has been so engaged in um, the grain agreement and in monitoring mm-hmm. the whole situation that conceivably they would be plugged in enough to have them be a nice bellwether indicator. At the same time, if Ukraine is any example, they didn't adjust for weeks um, and they didn't like get a handle on the situation for a yeah. while. So I wouldn't, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be as confident except r- perhaps as something is about to go off, maybe that's when you'd see it, but I wouldn't count on that for a multiple week, let alone multiple month, month leading indicator. Right. Once it starts, that's going to be a big problem. Um, and sim- the it looks like Europe's broken some of its inflationary problems. You add in another supply chain disruption, and that's going to derail the situation. And then, finally, a potential refugee crisis that spirals out of this, the scale and size of this war 
would mean it could intersect with Turkey and also spill over and have ripple effects in North Africa. There's a very, for why, why is North Africa relevant? Turkey and Russia brush up in two areas, Syria and Libya. Those have both been, insofar as one can reasonably describe it, at peace, not violent, for about 18 months, because they both, re both parties reached a tenuous consensus and the war in Ukraine starts. And no one has an incentive to disrupt the balance. If this starts to spiral outward, then all of the sudden Ankara, which has its own interests vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Russia, but fundamentally does not see Iran, the growth of Iranian power as something that benefits its interests in the region, and also does not see Russia's presence in the Eastern Mediterranean as beneficial, could capitalize. It could feel the need to reestablish deterrence with Russia. Similarly, Russia could use this as more space and opportunity to try to overstretch the West and start another series of crises in North Africa. So these, th and of course, the third implication becomes a lot more likely the longer the conflict goes sure. on, which is, it, and it means that the, the first two aspects of it as well, particularly the second question about shipping prices and the flow of goods will compound the potential for number three because you have the same economic effects in the Middle East and in North Africa as you would in Europe, but it always goes worse when you have major inflationary problems in societies that are just much poorer as a baseline. When you, when, you, when you talk to people, I mean, you are, you know, like you're talking to many policymakers, analysts uh, from around the world. Like, do they have this, you know, issue on their radar? Do you, like, is there yes. like, a, yes. Okay. Yes, so, like, no, absolutely. Because it does seem to be still like um, a little bit of an out of consensus view, right? So um, it's, it's um, you know, like, so what's the sentiment? Like, you know, I think that's, that's the question. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an, it's an out of consensus view, I think, for two reasons. One, there's so much focus on Ukraine right. for obvious, like completely obvious reasons um, that just when it comes to the, the, the news cycle and what the average individual can absorb, even the politically engaged one or even someone who works in um, a financial sector that this matters to, that's what they're going to be focusing on rather than this. And two, the Middle East, there are so many different domestic tugs of issues in each of the major actors that it makes these really convoluted causal causational channels to get all of this spiraling together. Iran, the regime there, we didn't talk much about this, but it's worth noting that it's still under a degree of pressure, not catastrophic, but under pressure. Mm. Khamenei is also very old and he's probably going to die soon, which leads to, I oh, say soon in right. a very general sense, by the way, very not on, on that i would not put any money on he's had we know he's had cancer um but that's about it but that transition will also induce other problems there saudi has everything it's it's less crazy than it used to be but saudi is always saudi and israel is still wrapped in the depths of this major constitutional crisis that's been on hold but isn't over by any means um so the reality is when one looks at the Middle East, the, mo the thing that one is drawn to is those questions rather than the major potential or the significant potential of a war in the Mediterranean littoral. But yeah, policy, I mean, on the policy side, this is not exactly a, a revolutionary um, opinion. And there are plenty of, I'm not, I'm not a, again, I'm a military analyst more so than anything. That's why I, my, my discussions of this is focused on the military the military calculations at play. Uh, but on the political side of it, and on those who I speak to who are very much Middle East Middle East analysts in particular, um, this is the thing amongst intelligence agencies and political establishments there, also just policy watchers that are that there were there was a suspicion that when I spoke to you last that this was gonna happen by now. Um, and it didn't. Everyone was somewhat, there were people who were surprised by that. Um, there are a variety of reasons for that. Again, these causational channels are very weird because it's not Europe where you have multi-party democracies that as insane as they are, as insane as they might be, they have constitutional structures that are visible. The Middle East doesn't work like that.